Okay, so we're going to get uh, started. Um, I apologize, you're not going to get a handout today because th apparently the copy center decided to be on uh, Thanksgiving break early because they didn't show up this morning. So um, I couldn't get the copies. They're sitting up there, but the room was locked, so I can't actually get them because I don't have the key. So anyway, you'll have to survive with the online version, um, which is obviously there, and you can work from that. Today, we're going to revisit your portfolio design. So I'm not going to talk for too long, but I am going to talk about covers and binding so that you guys can start thinking that direction. Remember, the portfolio is due on the 11th. You're, you're going to come in on December 11th, and you're going to turn in your portfolio. I'm going to have little stickies so you can write where you had it bound and how much it costs, because everybody asks me, and I don't know. So it's on the back of the portfolios. You'll turn those in. You'll grab a donut, have a donut. See, life is good, right? And then, and then you'll sit down at the computers and you'll do a, uh, a survey about the class, about what you liked and what you didn't like, what you thought worked, what you didn't work. Because I then, after I finish the grade, so you can say whatever you want, it won't change your grade at all. right? It's anonymous even. You don't even put your name on it. But um, after, you, after, you, after I submit the grades, I read out all that stuff. And based on what you say, I tweak things. So I change things. You guys say, oh, I really hated this assignment. I might change it. If you said, oh, blending masks, I was just really, really confused about blending modes. Maybe I'll change the lecture. So those are the kinds of things that give me good feedback so that I know what's working and what's not working to try to make the class better. So you guys will eat your donut, and you'll fill out that little survey. Life is good, right? I also try really hard to get the grades done quickly. So chances are this semester, because I have to review for the 220, um, It'll probably be I'll submit the grades on Wednesday. So Wednesday the 13th, I'll submit the grades, which means you should get them on Thursday. So I try to have that all done, and, and we can walk away. If you have a question about your grade or, or whatever, come see me next semester, because I'm taking winter break off. <laughs> right? So um, today we're going to go back and revisit your portfolio designs. Um, I want you to spend the day. You'll have a lot of time working on it today, trying to get pretty well wrapped up. You have almost everything that goes in the portfolio now. You'll have a few more of the SketchUp drawings to go in, but you kind of you could even put the SketchUp drawing, the, 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 the one that you just did, you could put just that one in several times as a placeholder. Remember, you have to include all of your assignments from this class, not your exercises. You can choose to include your exercise, but you don't have to. Just the assignments. So there'll be six mandatory things that have to be in there. Beyond that, if you do work in other classes, you're in 121 and you did some watercolors, you're, you did posters, I don't know, whatever, those kinds of things that you do. You do your Calder Museum, you do your Mondrian Museum, all of those kinds of things. If you'd like to include those in your portfolio, by all means, include them in your portfolio. Remember, your portfolio is about you. It's showing your best work. So I will not be offended if the digital tool stuff is at the end of your portfolio and you've chosen to emphasize better, higher quality work. That's OK. For this class, you obviously have to include those items because I'm making it mandatory. You also, I'm not under some, some delusional spell here, that you may decide to cut out the digital tool stuff later on when you go to use your portfolio. It's OK. I'm OK with that. Okay, But for this, you have to include it. So make sure you do include all those things. I will be looking for them. We're going to talk today about covers and binding options. Um, I think it's important to talk about covers and binding options because uh, you guys are going to be figuring out how this is going to go together uh, and how it's be going to become a book. Remember that this is the one time in class where I'm going to grade the printed version, not the online version. You'll still submit the online version, but I'm not going to be grading that one. I'm going to grade the actual physical book. Okay, So how it turns out matters in this case. How it prints matters. So let's talk about covers and what goes on a cover. You may find that you actually want to go back and revisit the, the discussion about what goes into a portfolio and whatever. Remember, we did that a couple months ago, a month and a half ago. Um, but today, we'll talk specifically about the cover. So minimum on the front page, you need to have your name. It's a portfolio about you. It needs to reflect that it is you. So the worst thing that you could do is turn in a portfolio and not have your name on it. Right? They want to know who you are. It needs to be obvious. So the cover absolutely must have your full, full name on it. Optional items, different people choose to do this differently. Maybe you're going to say portfolio. 
Maybe you're going to say design portfolio. Maybe you're going to say architecture portfolio, selected works. There's lots of ways of saying this. If you do a Google search for this, you can see lots of different ways of people saying it. Sometimes people include it. Sometimes people don't. If you're applying to a specific program, let's say you're applying to get your master's at Berkeley, sometimes there's requirements. You have to have your, your name on it, but you also have to say you know, you're an option two candidate for the master's program or something. Sometimes there are additional requirements. For this class, there is no additional requirement. It just has to have your name on it. The other thing that people include is a year or a date range. The assumption here is that because your portfolio is an evolving document, it's always being updated and changed, this particular edition is the 2017 edition. Next year, you're going to have a 2018 edition. So maybe having the date makes sense. Not necessary, but maybe. It's in the optional category. So let's look at some examples. I broke these into categories. And they're a little bit loose. But I'm going to start with text only, and then we'll get into some of the more um, graphic portfolio covers. If we do text only, essentially it's going to say your name and maybe architecture portfolio. Sometimes people include their logos on it. Sometimes they don't. I would be careful with logos unless you have a really, really good logo. Right? Unless you're really proud of your logo, it doesn't necessarily need to show up everywhere. Sometimes something as simple as a name, interior architect. That's it. Plain white cover. I'm a fan of the, the very simple. I think it always looks good. Though there are some in here that look pretty good that are a little bit more complicated. Just like I've done in the past, I brought all the portfolios that are A's and B's from previous semesters that people didn't take, away, take back. Uh, at the end of the sem or the beginning of the following semester, um, so they're in the back, so you can look through and see what other people have done as part of it. So these are essentially all text-based, single color background, text in front, and you can see that for the most part, people are including architecture portfolio, their name and maybe something else. Those are all text on a plain colored background, or relatively plain colored background. Sometimes they move into portfolios with an abstract background, something like this. Is this really a project? Is it really something that you've done? Probably. They probably made this, but it's not really showing anything specific. It's a design. And so something like this works rather nicely with the shadows. I mean, it's, a, it's an attractive front cover. It gets a, a little bit more interest than just the text background. Again, it's a matter of personal preference. Another example here, I think this was just an example that somebody put together. I don't, I don't particularly agree with the font or the font placement, but that's, that's beside the point. <laughs> Another example here, a little bit more casual. I think this works nicely with the ink, the, the tape, over with the weird font with the person's name is awful. Okay, I just have to be honest, it's just terrible. Right? The drop shadow, whatever, it's not, not working for me. So you have to be aware of that kind of stuff. Yeah, little, little Cartoon Network-esque or whatever. So something like this is more of a photographic background, just the texture. It's still kind of plain. It's, it's a slightly different than just a single gray background. It has a little bit of grunge or a little bit of texture to it. So that might be an idea. This font works really well projected because it's thin. When it gets printed out, I'm a little concerned because they're going to try to, the, the gray is going to bleed into the white and it's going to be hard to read. So you have to be careful with something like that, even though it looks really sharp and crisp here. So a lot of times people do this where they, they break down the words or they try to play creative games. Um, it says portfolio. It's really hard to read. At least for me, it's really hard to read. So I would stay away from trying to get cute with something like this and just be clean. Another example here with the abstract background. This has like a, a working drawing plan with a lot of depth and a lot of intensity. You don't want to just go online and find an image. If you're going to do something like this in the background, it has to be something you actually drew. So make sure whatever it is that you're using as that backdrop is something that you specifically did. 
you know, when I was doing searches for portfolios, whatever this binding is with the hinge and the screws and whatever is apparently really popular right now because all the, like, the Pinterest sites show this as their portfolio. I don't know. It's a little heavy-handed to me. I think a, a cleaner, nicer binding would be a little bit better, but it is the trend right now at least. Another example here. We'll come back to the cutouts uh, in a little bit. So this one's an actual photograph of a concrete wall behind, but I think this turned out pretty nice. The little gray bar accentuates portfolio with the person's name and or school, and the, the concrete background works nice. It is well composed on the concrete. This dirt works nicely. We've got this little form line. It's, it's still the same rules of composition that we talked about earlier on in the semester. This represents urban design and planning. No surprise, it's more of the urban design setup. So if you're an industrial design student, you might want to have something that's a little bit more framed in that light. Very abstract. This one is a, is a full spread, so it folds around. It wraps around the book. So you have to imagine the fold happening here so you'd see half of it. You do not have to include any kind of a barcode or anything like that. That's, that's beyond the, yeah. You're not selling your portfolio, right? So obviously, this style is popular as well with the cityscape. This is Alex Holgraf's Volume 3 portfolio. I think it's a good one to kind of see how he spent a lot of time developing this portfolio and understanding what the layers were. It has an abstract background behind it, uh, but the text is also really clean and really well done. This is what it looks like folded out flat. He's envisioned the front and the back. You do not have to have a back if you don't want to have a back. So you, you only need the front cover. The back is optional. Examples. This time, we're going to do some kind of a project behind. So everything else before was abstract. It's not tied specifically to a project. Then in this context, we're taking whatever the person's best project is and using parts of that project as the background. So there's a little drawing on that one. This is uh, laser engraved. It, to me, if, if somebody were to hand me this, it would be a little bit too bulky. Right? It's like it's got wood planks on it. It's too much. Something like this. I actually think this one is really nicely done. Okay? The, little, the little hand sketch makes it a little bit more casual. Portfolio, the person's name, spring 2016. Font choice is great. Spacing is great. All of that typographic stuff has been well done. It's, it's nicely centered, except for the drawing has a little bit of shift to it. It's a really clean, nice front cover. The only risk with something like this is that you're emphasizing hand drawing versus some other style that you might be more interested in. Let's say you're really interested in computer renderings. Suddenly, you're showing a hand drawing. Maybe the, the first person, remember, this is the first thing that somebody's going to see about you. And if they're seeing that, they're going to assume you like to hand draw or you like to sketch. So you have to think about, how is this portraying me and my design ideas? Another example here with a little bit of 3D model. I think this one's really well done. It's, it's obviously, it's a little bit abstract. This must be something that was part of his work. But the light source and the shadows and the deep blacks and whatever, it's kind of halfway between photograph of work and abstract. So it's kind of a good play. This one's actually pretty nice, except for the red tone. I don't know. Somehow, if we go back to color theory, the red sky, it doesn't quite feel right. So you want to think about those things. So all the things that I've talked about in class, color theory folds back in. Composition folds back in. All of those things fold back in as part of this. This one's nicely done. A little bit more casual on the cover. You got the sketching. I mean, it helps if you're really good at sketching. So we have this nice sketch with the overlay of some of the drawings. There's a little bit of a photograph in one corner. So it shows some multimedia. It's really nice. Another example here. This one showed up a little bit, um, little bit dark on the screen. This is the, the 3D rendering. You know, and they obviously chose to do the, the 3D night rendering. For those of you that are in Rhino, 
or maybe are taking Rhino next semester, hint, hint, right? This would be a lot better if there was a bunch of light in the, in the building spilling out. So yes, you have a night render, but essentially all you did in this night render is you put a night sky in. So a true night render would have a bunch of light glowing out of the building, and you'd see that. Um, or across this little bridge. So there's a little bit more that you could do, especially if it was going to be your cover. Another example here, I think the background is kind of nice. The composition is rather nice. But the, uh, the font choice, especially the uh, RB casual, well, it just doesn't quite work for me. And I, I, I apologize for picking on some of these, but I think some of the best ways of explaining what works and what doesn't work is to point out things that don't quite work. So sometimes people move it a step further, and they move into actually photographing a model that they built as a background. And that can work rather nicely, too. It shows a little bit of care. It shows some handcraftedness, uh, which can work out really nice. Another example here, really good black cover with just this one piece. This obviously required some Photoshop work. It wasn't quite this black when they photographed it. But it works really nicely. And compositionally, it works really nicely. Think rule of thirds on this one. Another example here of the wood carving or the 3D uh, you know, CAD CAM router or whatever. It works nice. The shadow is a nice touch as part of this. So it's definitely a photograph of a 3D object. But it's obviously a controlled photograph. It doesn't have weird background stuff. It doesn't have dust or anything. It's, it's carefully conceived. Cutouts. This is another thing that you can do if you have access to a laser cutter, where you actually cut things out of, of acrylic or uh, board stock or museum board or whatever. And it can be really nice, because you get a glimpse of what's happening on the page inside. If you're going to do something like this, you have to think very carefully about what that first page is. Because that first page is obviously showing through. So if the first page is something attractive and gets you excited about it, maybe it's a good idea to do something like this. This is cut on acrylic uh, using a laser cutter. If you do the settings right on acrylic, you can actually get a really, really nice cut because it melts the edges and it's nice and smooth. So that's something that you could do should you want to, not required. So binding options. Traditional. These are the ones that are readily available at Staples, Office Max, Office Depot, you know, those kinds of office supply stores, Kinko's, et cetera. Well, I guess it's called FedEx now. Whatever. You know what I mean, right? So these are the ones that are generally readily available. The spiral. So it's generally made of plastic. Unfortunately, it causes a misalignment of flow lines on facing pages. And I'm going to show you a live example so this makes more sense, which makes it better for a one-sided book as opposed to a book that has spreads. It takes about a quarter of an inch for the binding. So I'm going to show these to you live, because sometimes it's easier to, to show you. OK, so I took out a portfolio that was from the back stack. OK? And when I open it, it has facing pages. But notice that the flow line jumps when it goes onto the next page because of the way the spiral works. So you either have to be aware of that, or you have to know that yours isn't going to align anymore. So if you, if you planned out your, and you'll see in the back, there's a large number of the portfolios that have spirals that are just single-sided sheets, so they don't have this problem. The other thing is some of the, the, the spiral bounds that are facing pages don't have a flow line that runs all the way across. And that saves you from this problem. Okay. So that's something to be really aware of as part of a spiral binding. The other thing is it's rather flexible. And so you just that's something you need to be aware of, is it's a more flexible, more casual binding. Oops, there we go. So there it is. You can see it up close. Plastic looks the same as, I mean, it is what it is. This one is in black. They make a clear. I think some of the ones in back are in clear. So that's fine. Sometimes the. Copy place will include plastic films on the front and the back. That's optional. That's something you can tell them, I want it, I don't want it. You also could add a thicker cover and thinner interior pages if you wanted to. You could print the cover on you know, a Bristol or a watercolor stock so it's a little heavier and have the inside pages something different. It's just something to be aware of that you can do. The comb binding can be metal or it can be plastic. Let's see if I can get one of the comb bindings out. There we go. The plastic, for lack of a better term, seems always a bit chunky. So if you look at the plastic here, I picked one. This one's black. 
Um, but I probably should have picked one that you could see a little bit better. It's just kind of beefy. The metal ones tend to be a little bit thinner, but they're harder to find. Not every store has them. The other thing about them is you have to pay attention to the size. So this one, the, uh, the size is a little bit small for the thickness of the portfolio, and it gets kind of jammed when you try to open it. Like it doesn't quite open all the way. And you can kind of hear it. It doesn't. So that's something to be aware of. Um, the good news is things flow across the page. This is not the best example. Let's see if I can have something where it folds a flows across here. So ultimately, you don't want any of the mechanics of the portfolio to take away from the work. So somebody's right. thinking about turning a page or the binding as opposed to your... Exactly, exactly. If they get caught up in the, the binding or the turning of the page, that's a problem, OK? So just like with the spiral, though, if you put something right in the center, there's a bunch of holes that are going to get punched in it. So in this particular example, there's text right in the center. Okay. Well, guess what happened to the end of this text? It got punched through. That makes it really hard to read the text. So if you spent time writing the text, somebody's not going to spend the time to read it because I can't read it. I'm missing letters and words and whatever. If you think about a portfolio, let's say that you're applying to grad school. And I use this example because it's a little bit bigger. Let's say you're applying to grad school. There maybe are 3,000 people applying to grad school. That means 3,000 people turned in portfolios. And they're going to accept 17, 20, maybe? Okay, Your odds aren't very high. How long are they going to spend looking at those 3,000 portfolios? 10 seconds? Front cover, first page, second page, third page. OK. All right. That's about all you're going to get. So you don't want the, the mechanics of it to interrupt that time. You don't get enough time as it is. So there's the comb binding. I think I have a picture of the metal. There's the metal comb. It's a little bit thinner, a little bit nicer looking, if you can find it. I think Staples used to do it, but I don't know that they do it anymore. These things, the, the, the companies that do this, they change what they have and what they don't have. So uh, that's part of why on the backs of a lot of these, you'll see the sticky notes that'll say where the binding, where they had it done, what kind of binding it was, and how much it cost. That's why I've started always doing that so that you can see. Okay. Another example close up of the comb binding. That can, act, can actually be a very nice, elegant binding. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, but you have to plan ahead for it. Again, you can do a thicker cover if you want it to be a little bit more rigid. So then we get into the handmade or the specialty bindings. So once we get past the standard, traditional FedEx Kinko's type bindings, uh, actually, I didn't include. There's one more standard FedEx binding I'll show you here. It's this one. It's got a plastic rib that goes across one side and a plastic rib that goes across the back side. In this particular example, it's pretty clean. I know these will all be in the back, so you can see them. Okay? So it's pretty clean. The challenge here is it doesn't open as far. So you get that fold in the center, which is fine if you don't have pictures. Let's see if I can find one that has a picture in it. She did a good job. These, the, there, there isn't a good example of where these die into the, yeah, there isn't anything here. Anyway, you have to be aware, if there's, a, if there's a picture that goes down into here, into that crease, you can lose part of it as the people are looking, wait, I can't open it far enough to see it. Okay, so you just be aware that you lose that in there as part of this style binding. But again, that's a standard FedEx Kinko's style binding. And again, they tend to put the clear and the black page on the back. So be aware of that. You can request them not to do that if you want. It. OK, so then we get into the handmade or the specialty bindings. So you can have your, your, your portfolio printed somewhere, and they can then bind it like a professional book would bind. The problem there is that you have to send it out and get it back in enough time to turn it in or, or whatever. So if you had more time, it would be easy to send it out to a professional print shop. They could make it, and you could get it back, and it would be like a nice book with a hardcover and, and that sort of thing, which can be a great strategy long term. For you guys in this class, it's pretty hard to do that because the turnaround time between when you're finished with your work and getting the portfolio bound is just not long enough. So you can do stuff yourself. And I used to, forever I had my grad school portfolio as part of this stack of portfolios, and it managed to disappear. So I don't have that one anymore. Um, but I actually handmade the binding on that one. It was, it was staples, but it had, um, 
essentially it was a, it was a watercolor paper that wrapped around the staples. So you couldn't see the staples, and it was glued together as a little binding. And it, it made a nice, clean look. I have some examples in the back where people have done, uh, like this one it was several years ago. Um, she actually printed it here at DVC, and she hand sewed the binding together with thread. And it's lasted really nicely, and it opens really nicely to all the pages. So it's an example of something that was relatively inexpensive that worked really nice for a portfolio. There's a hand care or a handcrafted nature about that. I had another one, it might have been last semester, same strategy, where it was a couple holes punched and some string tied through it, and this can work just fine. You still have a little bit of the problem where the images get lost in the crease, but that's something that, that is the nature of it. On, on my binding that I made with the little staples, I folded every page so it was all creased, so it would actually open. I lost about a quarter inch in the binding, but it would actually fold open and lay flat. So that's certainly something that you can do. Thinking about covers and how they glue together, you can kind of see here that one of the pages tucks around and then glues into the cover and then tucks back. That's a professional print shop. Making the front and back covers. These little tabs here are where you can glue and fasten the pages together so that they open. Sewed corners. There's thread on these. This is again a professional binding. This is what you get out of the professional binding where it's like perfect. Another example here with folds. Okay, so there is one other type of binding that I've seen done. This one, which is like a professional bound look, uh, which is really nice. I haven't seen any recently and people always ask me where the ha they had these bound. This was about 2008, maybe. So it's really old. So I have no idea where this person had it bound. But it, to this day, is one of the best portfolios somebody's ever turned in. So it's still in the stack. Um, so there's a few of those that you can look for as well uh, in the back. So as part of today, I want you to work on your cover, obviously. We talked about covers today. But also work on your overall layout. Start getting all your content in, et cetera. If you get to the point where you want to talk about it, Ask me, I'll sit down with you, we'll take a look at it. We can talk about how to fit certain things on pages. Remember to be conscious about your decisions. Fonts should match page to page. Flow lines should match page to page. All of this stuff is your body of work. The worst portfolio is the one where the graphic design is so ugly that people don't want to look at your content. Right? The best portfolio is where the graphic design is so good that people don't notice the graphic design. That's the best one. That's the purpose. Okay? So I'm going to turn you guys loose. Spend some time in the back and look at the examples. That can help get you started and inspired. Certainly look at the bindings and think about it. Remember on the backs of a lot of the pages, sometimes it's on the inside cover. This one, for example, is on the inside cover. There's a sticky note. It'll tell you where they had it printed and how much it cost. That, I know that's always a factor for students. So I always try to encourage them to put that on it as well. Are there any questions? No? OK.